on Reason Radio. So you know what my first thought was when I heard that um, the Milwaukee Bucks decided to boycott the game against the Orlando Magic tonight? I have a feeling I do know. (laughs) My first thought was, does that mean the Orlando Magic get the win? Yeah! No. No. (laughs) No? no, I mean, we'll take it. Come on. I mean, everyone knows I'm a diehard Magic fan. (laughs) Um, And even more of a Magic fan when one of the players decided not to kneel for the National Anthem this year. Um, But... I thought, oh, well, does that mean we get the win? Because we're down, I believe we're down 3-1 right now. If the Bucks Ooh, won, we could use it. It would have been over. So we could use the win. I mean, I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of a lame way to get a win, but I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> no, unfortunately, that is not what happened. Uh, according to Fox News here, the NBA postponed all of Wednesday playoff games after the Milwaukee Bucks opted to boycott Game 5 of their series against the Orlando Magic, and other teams quickly followed suit in protest of the police shooting of a black man in Wisconsin. The players forced the league's hand after protesting the Sunday shooting by Kenosha police of Jacob Blake, a 29-year-old black man. Bucks guard George Hill told the undefeated outlet that we're tired of the killings and the injustice. How many of you listening right now are done with the NBA? I mean, some of you are done with it already, I have a feeling. Yeah. I have a feeling more of you will be done with it now. Wait until you hear some of the audio I have of this because, well, it is just beyond reason. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I am your host, Michael Yaffe, once again, the voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason. We're on until 8 p.m. tonight here on News Radio WFLA Orlando. Of course, if you miss any of the show and catch the podcast, on the I, on the iHeart Radio app or anywhere podcasts are available. I've been hosting the morning show all week. Good morning, Orlando. That's it's, where you've been. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, you can catch the podcast of that too. I actually interviewed Eric Trump this morning. Ooh. He spoke at the RNT last night and then spoke to mm-hmm. us. Mm-hmm. And you know what he said to us? He said, ah, "I can't wait to see you in person when I'm in Orlando." Ooh. And I said, "Well, okay, you better come in studio." <laughs> You have to invite him over to the the apartment and uh, yeah. have some drinks, <laughs> right? You know, Alan Spector made a good point. Maybe if we can get him and the president to come here, maybe they'll speed things up on the studio construction. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well. uh, we got the president coming now. Can we make this place look a little bit nicer here? You know, so that was very interesting. We are going to talk about the convention. I wanted to do an episode of Beyond Reason this week, at least once, even though I'm doing the morning show because. Um, I, I wanted to give my take on the convention so far, but that's not what I'm going to lead with today. Believe it or not, we have to lead with what's going on no. with these protests and the reaction to the protests in Kenosha. I, I'm, I'm falling into the narrative myself. Look what I did. I fell into the, main, the riots, violence yes. in Kenosha, yes. not protests. Protests, yes. Uh, by the way, the voice you hear over there today, of course, is Mr. Tom Benson producing as well. How are you, Tom? I'm doing fine, except I'm protesting <laughs> because I'm not into violence. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what are we protesting uh, I today? Don't know. I'll think of something before the show's over. <laughs> you just want to you just want to join the club yeah. of protesting. I want to be in with the in crowd. Uh, you know, it's actually interesting you say that because I was thinking today when I was prepping for the show. How how hard it is right now, it seems like, how discouraging it is right now to be on our side, because it mm. seems like the culture, when it comes to pop culture or Hollywood or the news media or in, even your friends on social media, is so overwhelmingly bought into the narrative yeah. of Black Lives Matter, of systemic racism, of America is bad and Trump is evil, and so much of this is Republicans' fault and all that. So I just see it, it's so discouraging. I mean, the fact is I can't even watch an NBA game. I can't even watch the Orlando Magic lose without hearing about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And you hear about them canceling games. I mean, it just seems like it's just one of those days. I think you are not. In the minority, I think there's a lot of the silent majority that feel the same way, and mm-hmm. they'll wait until November 3rd to vote. That's yeah. where they'll be heard. Well, 
And a lot of them are going to be heard because the polls are starting to tighten up. Yeah. And let's face it, the convention this week, the RNC, they've done a lot better than the Democrats did last week. It's just a better convention. Mm -hmm. You know, I admitted at the end of last week that Biden actually did a good job with his speech. I disagreed with a lot of what he said, but he at least delivered it well. I thought it was a good speech also. Yeah. The first thing, the first reaction I had, though, was when, when it was over, well, who's going to believe this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he, he tried to portray once, himself, once again himself as a moderate. Yeah. But the party's not moderate anymore. And they're siding with, basically siding and justifying the riots. Although that has changed a little bit today. The reason why that changed is very interesting. Yeah, we know why. Mm -hmm. But it has changed. But I want to play audio here from a coach in the NBA, Doc Rivers. Now, he used to coach the Orlando Magic, and believe it or not, I've met him a couple times. You know, very quickly, he doesn't remember. I was working at Checkers in the, in the drive-thru, <laughs> and he, he came and ordered food with his son. You want cheese with that, sir? <laughs> <laughs> and I actually said, hey, I know you are, go Magic, and all that stuff. Yeah. He seemed like a nice guy. Yeah. Was driving a very, very nice car. Of course. <laughs> He's got a lot of money. Definitely does better in life than I'm doing. <laughs> but listen to him here talk about the shooting of Jacob Blake by the police. And this is, I, I want to believe that this violence is going to stop, especially because a lot of Democrats are finally coming out and condemning it. But I listen to this and I'm like, it's not going to stop. I don't see it stopping anytime soon because they're never going to be satisfied. That's the, and I like Doc Rivers. I want to give people like him the benefit of the doubt, but just listen to what he said here. It's, it's amazing why we keep loving this country and this country does not love us back. And it's just, it's really so sad. Like, I should just be a coach. And it's so often reminded of my color. Can you pause it right there? He said, it's sad that we keep loving this country and the country doesn't love us back. The country has treated you very well, Mr. Rivers. It has. The idea that a... A famous basketball coach like Doc Rivers, who has sent teams to the NBA Finals and is a well-known, liked figure in this country, and saying, well, the country, we love this country, but it doesn't love us back. I, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. What, why are you saying this? Well, he continues on and says why he's saying it. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> why we keep loving this country and this country does not love us back and it's just it's really so sad like I should just be a coach and it's so often reminded of my color you know it's just really sad we gotta do better uh, but we gotta demand better like we got. You know, it's, it's funny. We protest, and they send riot guards, right? Uh, they send people in riot outfits. They go to Michigan with guns, and they're spitting on cops, and nothing happens. The training has to change in the police force. The unions have to be taken down in the police force. I can agree My with that My dad one. was a cop. I believe in good cops. We're not trying to defund the police oh, and take all the money away. We're trying to get them to protect us, just like they protect everybody else. Uh, I didn't want to talk about it before the game because it's so hard. Like, to just keep watching it. That video, if, if you watch that video, you don't need to be black to be outraged. You don't. You need to be American and outraged. And how dare the Republicans talk about fear? We're the ones that need to be scared. We're the ones having to talk every to every black child 
Red and white father has to give his son a talk about being careful if you get pulled over. It's, it's just ridiculous. So, looking at the video, we should all be outraged. Why? We just want him to protect us, right? Well, did you know that most likely it was an African-American who called the cops on this guy? Because apparently, according to the police scanner, he uh, took someone's keys and got into an altercation with someone, and they called the cops on him. And it was probably a black person who called the cops on him. So they were there to protect you. But he also had a warrant out for his arrest. For he was a, He's had a criminal history. He also resisted arrest, scuffled with the officers, didn't follow their orders, and went to his car and grabbed something. Oh, but he shouldn't have died. Cops need to do better. They need better training. Why is the burden always on the cop? Why isn't the burden ever on the person the cops are talking to? If you follow what they say, the cops don't go into situations like that wanting to kill black people. They don't. There's no evidence of that. Even with the George Floyd thing, there's no evidence that he did it because he was black. And yet we're constantly told this narrative that, well, they only do this because the person's black. And they have no proof. It's just a narrative. You know, James Woods, the actor, I know you follow him on Twitter, Tom Benson. Sure. Mm -hmm. He posted a video this week that was pretty compelling. Uh, It's a video that says, when you don't shoot a killer resisting arrests and reaching in his car. And it literally shows a got a traffic stop where they're trying to arrest someone. Mm-hmm. I saw it. And he reaches into his car. First, he, he resists arrest, tries to beat up the officers. They try to tase him. It doesn't work. He reaches into his car as the cops decided not to shoot him. Well, what did he reach for in his car? It was a gun. And then he shot at the officers and almost killed the officers. Who's to say that wouldn't happen this time? We don't even know what he was reaching for. We're not being told what he was reaching for. I understand it's a tough job. I understand that there is some burden on the cops to do the right thing, to be trained correctly, to not escalate situations. But I also understand that there's a burden on the person, on the citizen, that if a cop tells you, gives you an order, you follow the order. And if you follow the order, you'll be fine. And that the vast majority of cops in this country are not out to get black people. They do not want Do you think right now a cop wants to shoot and kill a black person? Do you honestly think there's any cop out there right now who really wants to do that in 2020 with everything that's going on? No cop wants to be put in this situation, but they do it because they have to, to save their lives because they want to go home to their families, just like anyone else. Yes, the cops have to do the right thing, and when a cop does something wrong, I stand with you for that they should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. I talked about the George Floyd thing on this show for a week that he, the officer should have been arrested. The officer was wrong. The best way we can pursue justice is on an individual basis. You want to root out bad cops, prosecute the bad cops, but that's not what I'm hearing anymore. We're no longer even believing what we see with our own eyes. We believe instead of a narrative. And a lot of times, you don't even have have all the information. And you'll see body cam video that will come out later that gives you all the information, and it still doesn't matter. The riots still want to destroy our cities. I got to talk about this more in a moment because my biggest question is, what did you expect? It's not going to change because the narrative isn't going to... They're being... Young people in this country have been taught to believe in really bad things about this country. Mm Mm-hmm. And the Democrats and Biden kind of paying lip service all of a sudden to peaceful protests is not going to help. Violence was inevitable when you teach young people that. So we'll continue on with this conversation in a moment. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe. We'll be right back. If you like Beyond Reason Radio, well, make sure to show it by liking the Facebook page at Facebook.com slash Beyond Reason Radio. The voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason is back now. So I don't want to be all doom and gloom today. I mean, there's a lot I could say it's beyond reason and doom and gloom. But I I will say this. 
you know, I talked about how it seems like the culture mm-hmm. is just so overwhelmingly against us. And today, days like today where the NBA is boycotting games, it just it just really seems like that. But I will say, watching the Republican convention, I did notice that, and you notice this as well, Tom Benson, I think there are a lot of African Americans in this country and other minorities in this country that are that are tired of it. Mm-hmm. They are tired of this narrative. Mm-hmm. They they feel like it's not helpful, and they want to fight against it because they want to be judged, you know, like Martin Luther King wanted by the content of their character, yeah, not the color of our skin, yeah. Thought that was the goal. Um, so we're going to talk more about the convention in a moment because I think the convention has actually gone pretty well, actually better than I expected. I wasn't sure because usually Democrats are better at production value. Because, you know, they own Hollywood <laughs> and TV and media and all that. But uh, you know, Trump's a reality TV star. Sure. So, I mean, they've actually done a pretty good job. He knows what he's doing. What's interesting, though, is the narrative is kind of changing a little bit on these violent protests. So, at first, Democrats and the media. And when I say the media, some people get mad at me. I'm talking about the mainstream left media sites, mm-hmm. CNN, MSNBC, well, you know, Wall the, Street, uh, well, the uh, Washington Post, Washington New, York Post Times. New York Times. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, you know what I'm talking about. But they're having, first they try to ignore it, the violence. Then they try to justify it. Now they're having to deal with it because it's actually affecting them politically. One person who brought this up, believe it or not, was Don Lemon on CNN saying uh, Biden is going to have to address this. Because it's really, really getting out of hand. Uh, here's what he said. I do think that uh, this, what you said was happening in Kenosha is a Rorschach test for the entire country. And I think this is a blind spot for Democrats. I think Democrats are ignoring this problem or hoping that it will go away. And it's not going to go away. And so, unless someone comes up with a solution over the next 73 days or 70 so however many days 68 days 68 days so it's not going to the the problem is not going to be fixed by then but what they can do and i think maybe joe biden may be afraid to do it i'm not sure maybe he won't maybe he is he's got to address it he's got to come out and talk about it he's got to do a speech like barack obama did about race He's got to come out and tell people that he is going to deal with the issue of police reform in this country and that what's happening now is happening under Donald Trump's watch and on Donald Trump's watch. And when he is the president, Kamala Harris is the vice president, then they will take care of this problem. But guess what? The rioting has to stop. Chris, as you know, and I know it's showing up in the polling. Mm -hmm. It's showing up in focus groups. It is the only thing, it is the only thing right now that is sticking. And the Democrats tonight stuck with that, right? And they also stuck with the theme that you said, the coronavirus. You got coronavirus and you have Kenosha. So now he's getting a lot of flack, as he should, because it seems like the only reason he cares about this is because it's affecting them in the polls. You know, whatever. The fact is, though, he's right. The fact is, it is sticking. There's a reason why the Republicans are focusing on it in the national convention. Because it's effective. And and they're continuing. That's why it's still sticking. Yeah, and it's continuing, and they're right on it, by the way. Look, the thing is, there are a lot, there's, when I hear Don Lemon speak and say, well, Joe Biden needs to address this issue, and then he talks about police reform and all that. Police reform isn't the problem. You think... Some legislation about police reform is going to stop these rioters. One more law. That's all we need. Uh huh. No, I ain't going to stop them because that's not what this is about. That's an excuse. They hate this country. They've been taught to hate this country. That's the problem. What did you expect when you taught many young people? And by the way, a lot of these young people rioting, they're white. So it's not, it's beyond race. They believe capitalism is evil. They believe police forces are evil. They believe Trump is a fascist Nazi. And you wonder why they they believe speech that they disagree with is equal to violence, so they have to respond in violence. What did you expect? And it's August, temperatures 80 degrees. Would yeah. they be doing this in January when the temperature is <laughs> zero? True. I well, don't and, think so. And everything was shut down because of the pandemic and yeah. all that. So that that's contributing as well. But it's like, what did you expect? This isn't about police reform. You think the narrative is why they're doing this? 
Oh well, we, if we address police reform, they'll just they'll just go away. Come on, give me a break. Because the narr- your narrative is based on a lie. That's the fact. The fact is the vast majority of police are good in this country. The fact is there really isn't even that much need for police reform in this country because policing, for the most part, they're doing a good job. But the one person who was trying to address police reform was Senator Tim Scott, a Republican, and the Democrats ignored it. I just wanted to point that out as well. We'll continue this conversation in a moment, and we'll talk about the convention. My thoughts on how the Republican convention is going and more. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yeffe. We'll be right back. If you miss any of the show, you can download the Beyond Reason podcast on iTunes. This is Orlando's Smart Talk Radio. Beyond Reason Radio continues now. Welcome back to the show. Right now, we're talking about the the violence in Kenosha, Wisconsin, just the latest city. Remember, it didn't start here. It started in Minneapolis, and it went to Seattle, then it went to Portland. Uh, they've had violence in Atlanta, Chicago. I mean, this is spreading. So that's why the Republicans have been focusing on it, because everyone can see it with their own eyes, and they're really, really worried about it. And the Democrats are f- finally having to address it and trying to fight against it. But the way they're doing it's interesting because they're basically telling the protesters, we agree with you. We agree with everything you're saying. Just just don't be violent and we'll do everything you want. We're going to placate to you. That's basically the impression I get. Uh, John Kasich, who's a Republican, who's basically turning into a Democrat, uh, endorsed Biden at the DNC or whatever because he doesn't like Trump. He also came out. He was asked about this. And he came out and uh, said Biden needs to address it. Here's what he said. Well, I've said a number of times now, and we'll say it again, uh, I think it is absolutely imperative for Joe Biden, who I, I have no doubt he feels this in his heart. Uh, the protests are something we need. It's, it's the street organizers that rises and brings change from the bottom up. Martin Luther King, John Lewis, who we just celebrated his life and, and honored his death. Uh, so when we look at these, at these issues, violence has no place. Martin Luther King took the beatings, the gassings, the jailings and said, we will not respond with violence. And I believe that it is absolutely essential for the Democrats to say, while we support protesters, this violence is abhorrent and actually sets back the ability to get change. Now, we don't know the full story in Wisconsin. It's this news that's coming out about mm-hmm. perhaps a vigilante. And what we know is that there are people who show up at these protests who are, des- who are there to design to disrupt and give everybody a bad name. But they have to be called out, Jim. Uh, Joe Biden needs to be very, very strong on the fact that while protests are are okay, they're, they're, they're a positive thing, they're America, this violence needs to be deeply condemned and deeply yeah. condemned now, sooner rather than later, in my opinion. This is a terrible thing that's happening in our country, and there's mm-hmm. no excuse and no reason for anybody look the other way when it comes to these violent acts. And I just hold up somebody like Martin Luther King who said, if you return mm-hmm. violence for violence, you lose. And I agree with him. So it seems that Joe Biden got the message, apparently. He was finally pressured into condemning this. And he sort of condemns it. The problem is he buys into the narrative of the protest. He, well, just listen to what he said. This came out today. He put out a video. Here it is. What I saw in that video makes me sick. Once again, a black man, Jacob Blake, has been shot by the police in broad daylight with the whole world watching. You know, I spoke to Jacob's mom and dad, sister, and other members of the family just a little bit earlier. And I told them justice must and will be done. You know, our hearts are with his family, especially his children. It's horrible what they saw. Watching their father get shot. Like Gianna Floyd, they're asking why. Why daddy? Put yourself in the shoes of resisted black arrest. father and black mother in this country and ask, is this what we want America to be? Is this the country we should be? You know, as I said after George Floyd's murder, protesting brutality is a right and absolutely necessary, but burning down communities is not protest, it's needless violence. Violence that endangers lives, violence that guts businesses and shutters businesses that serve the community, that's wrong. In the midst of this pain, The wisest words that I've heard spoken so far have come from Julia Jackson, Jacob's mother, 
She looked at the damage done in her community and she said this, quote, this doesn't reflect my son or my family. So let's unite and heal, do justice, end the violence, and end systemic racism in this country now. See, the problem with this is he's basically telling the protesters, yeah, you're right. America's, we have systemic racism and injustice, and it's pretty much a bad place and all of this stuff. But, you know, just don't be violent. And the protesters, and not even, I'm not even talking about the protesters, the rioters. The rioters are like, why would we stop? You agree with us. Our tactics are working. Mm Mm-hmm. Your words mean nothing to me now because our tactics are working. And we want more. Yeah. I mean, if they, if they think about it. If you believe America is systemically racist, that capitalism is pretty much evil and unfair, that, um, I mean, we could go on with all of the things that complain about the country, that any kind of speech that you think is intolerant, that you believe is intolerant, is equal to violence and should be met with violence... Why would you why would you not commit violence and loot and mm-hmm. destroy things? Mm-hmm. It totally falls in line with the narrative. And then everyone's like, well, why is this happening? You know why it's happening. And it's not gonna unfortunately, I want to believe the Democrats condemning this will stop it. But I don't think it will, because they're not really condemning it. They're not condemning the anarchists or just kind of, oh well, well, yeah, we, we don't like the violence, but that's on the side burner. We agree with you. I mean, he think if he's president today, he would totally come out against the cops in that city without having all the evidence in front of him on it. Think about that. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's uh, move on to uh, the Republican National Convention. A little contrast for what the Bem- Democrats have been doing. Some observations. I-, I talked about this a little bit on the morning show, but a couple of observations on the Republican National Convention. One, the two major themes that I noticed, especially on the first night, is one that America is not a racist country, but a land of opportunity, and two, that we need law and order. Those are the two big themes I've noticed. The other thing I've noticed, which is kind of interesting, when you watch the Democrat convention, most of it was anti-Trump, 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 anti-Trump. A lot of it wasn't even pro-Biden. I mean, there was some, yeah, well, Biden's our guy and we like him, but most of it wasn't even that. It was just anti-Trump. Which didn't work wonders for Hillary back in 2016. No, of course not. Because people want to vote for somebody. But what's interesting about the Republican National Convention is it's not a lot of anti-Biden. I don't know if anyone else has noticed that. It's there. I'm not saying there hasn't been any anti-Biden. But most of it is not anti-Biden, anti-Biden. A lot of it's anti-left, anti-radicals, anti-leftism. But it's not specific towards one person it's not specific towards biden as the candidate which is really interesting but i also noticed that there is a lot of support in the convention for the president who is the candidate for them but for trump a lot of people coming out and strongly supporting trump i didn't see that kind of strong support for biden last week Mm -hmm. it's it's a noticeable difference and i think it's going to make a difference The other thing I noticed that we'll get into a little bit later, but the most powerful speakers at the convention, in my opinion, of the week so far, have not been the politicians, have not been the typical political speakers that you would think would be really, really good. Those who have really had the most powerful messages for people are the average people, the non-politicians who have a message. And I'm going to play some examples of that. It was really smart of President Trump and the Republicans to promote your average citizens who have a strong message. Because it's really been effective, I think. Much effective than just having your typical politicians over and over again. Now, Melania Trump, uh, Trump's wife, spoke last night. She did a pretty good job, I thought. Actually, she she got a lot of praise even from mainstream outlets, I, I noticed. But there's one thing Melania said here that if if the Trump campaign focuses on this and uses it, Trump will win. Here's what Melania said. Just as you are fighting for your families, my husband, our family, and the people in this administration are here fighting for you. 
No matter the amount of negative or false media headlines or attacks from the other side, Donald Trump has not and will not lose focus on you. He loves this country, and he knows how to get things done. As you have learned over the past five years, he's not a traditional politician. He doesn't just speak words. He demands action, and he gets results. The future of our country has always been very important to him, and it is something that I have always admired. If they can focus on that message, I think it will be very effective because she said, look, Trump is not your typical politician, which we all know, but he's a man of action who loves this country. Because I still believe that the vast majority of voters out there, they want to, they love this country, but they want to love this country. And when they watch the Democrats in the convention, they don't feel like they love the country as much. They love the power. Yeah, they they want to change everything about the country. So they they're they're not it's just not having the same effect. So if a president can come out and campaign on the fact that America is good and that he loves this country, I think it will be effective. I really do. And th- that's why I really like that. Now, I did mention in just a minute ago that there hasn't been a whole lot of anti-Biden, anti-Biden, anti-Biden. There was one person, though, who really came out against the Bidens. She was Specifically, tough. she was really tough. Uh, former Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi. She came out and spoke and went right after the Bidens. Very interesting. Here it is. Democrats have been lecturing America about integrity for four years, while their nominee has been writing the textbook on abuse of power for 40 years. If they want to make this election a choice between who's saving America and who's swindling America, bring it on. Joe says he'll build back better. Yeah, build the Bidens back better. Our president is in this to build a safer, better, and stronger America. And he will finish what he started to keep this a real land of opportunity for everyone. Yeah, so that that was really good stuff. Another person who spoke, got a lot of flack for speaking, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. He actually spoke from Jerusalem. A lot of people thought, oh, this is breaking tradition. Secretaries of State shouldn't speak. Now, last week, I mean, they had former Secretaries of State speak. And they had former President speak, which doesn't always happened strongly against the can't you know strongly against trump like he did but i don't understand why that was the norm to begin with we all know that the secretary of state works for the president and wants to work for the president and is technically a political figure who (laughs) supports the president so I, i don't really understand why this is such a big deal that he spoke but he came out strongly in support of trump and here is pompeo This president has led bold initiatives in nearly every corner of the world. In China, he's pulled back the curtain on the predatory aggression of the Chinese Communist Party. The president has held China accountable for covering up the China virus and allowing it to spread death and economic destruction in America and around the world. And he will not rest until justice is done. Today, because of the president's determination and leadership, the ISIS caliphate is wiped out. It's gone. Its evil leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, is dead. And our brave soldiers, they're on their way home. So, there you go. He's exactly right there. Um, Coming up in the next segment, I want to highlight those ordinary people who had the powerful messages during the convention. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yeffe. We'll be right back. If you heart Beyond Reason Radio, listen to the Beyond Reason Radio podcast on iHeartRadio. Just download the iHeartRadio app and search Beyond Reason Radio. The place where we talk faith, culture, and politics. Beyond Reason Radio continues. Yes, this is the place where we talk faith, culture, and politics. We don't shy away from the controversial issues here on Beyond Reason Radio. And if you miss any of the show, make sure to catch the podcast and share it with your friends. It's available for you all free of charge for free on the radio and on the podcast. You know, I'm just so generous, aren't I? So we're talking about the Republican National Convention. And I mentioned in the last segment that I... 
some of the politicians were good that have spoken so far. And, the you know, you have your typical politicians, but also your typical political types out mm-hmm, there speaking. Mm-hmm. But the most powerful speakers so far, in my opinion, have been the non-politicians. I have a few examples of that. And, you, and you'll, I, I have a feeling you'll agree with me right after this. The first worst person I want to uh, mention, this is Florida businessman Maximo Alvarez. He is a Cuban-born immigrant talks about how his family escaped socialism here's what he said i'm speaking to you today because i have seen people like this before i've seen movements like this before i've seen ideas like this before and i am here to tell you we cannot let them take over our country i heard the promises of fidel castro and i can never forget all those who grew up around me, who look like me, who suffer and starve and died because they believe those empty promises. I mean, how do you argue against that? The guy saw it for himself and he came to America and he lived the American dream and he's an, Im- he's an immigrant and he's a minority, but he supports Trump and he loves his country. I'm telling you, powerful message. Now, the other person who had a very powerful message, Andrew Pollock, his daughter Meadow was shot down and killed in the Parkland shooting. You can tell when you will hear him speak, he's just passionate about the issue. He's passionate about law and order and safety for children in schools, frankly. And he just speaks from the heart and you can tell that it's real. When he talks about why he supports President Trump, this is effective. I'm telling you it is. Here's what he said. Far left Democrats in our school district made this shooting possible because they implemented something they called restorative justice. This policy, which really just blames teachers for students' failures, puts kids and teachers at risk and makes shootings more likely. But it was billed as a pioneering approach to discipline and safety. I was just fine with the old approach to discipline and safety. It was called discipline and safety. But the Obama-Biden administration took Parkland's bad policies and forced them into schools across America. I mean, powerful. Now, another one I want you to hear. You're, you're going to like this. Although, I mean, the message, it, it's disturbing when you hear some of it. You'll, you'll get what I'm saying in a moment. This is Abby Johnson. She used to work for Planned Parenthood. She left Planned Parenthood, describes why, and then describes why she supports President Trump. This might be the best case I've ever heard against abortion ever made. Here it is. I spent eight years working for Planned Parenthood, but today I'm a pro-life activist. I truly believed I was helping women, but things drastically changed in 2009. In April, I was awarded Planned Parenthood's Employee of the Year Award and invited to their annual gala where they present the Margaret Sanger Award, named for their founder. And Margaret Sanger was a racist who believed in eugenics. Her goal when founding Planned Parenthood was to eradicate the minority population. Today, almost 80% of Planned Parenthood abortion facilities are strategically located in minority neighborhoods. Later in August, my supervisor assigned me a new quota to meet, an abortion quota. I was expected to sell double the abortions performed the previous year. When I pushed back, underscoring Planned Parenthood's public-facing goal of decreasing abortions, I was reprimanded and told, abortion is how we make our money. But the tipping point came a month later when a physician asked me to assist with an ultrasound-guided abortion. Nothing prepared me for what I saw on the screen. An unborn baby fighting back, desperate to move away from the suction. And I'll never forget what the doctor said next. Beam me up, Scotty. The last thing I saw was a spine twirling around in the mother's womb before succumbing to the force of the suction. And I now support President Trump because he has done more for the unborn than any other president. 
During his first month in office, he banned federal funds for global health groups that promote abortion. That same year, he overturned an Obama-Biden rule that allowed government subsidy of abortion. He appointed a record number of pro-life judges, including two Supreme Court justices. And importantly, he announced a new rule protecting the rights of health care workers objecting to abortion, many of whom I work with every day. You know, there's a few reasons why that's effective. One, she has credibility because she used to work for Planned Parenthood. She saw it with her own eyes. Two, I think there's a lot of people out there who don't really th- realize or think about what actually happens in an abortion. I don't think they don't want to think about it. Oh, well, it's just getting rid of some tissue or something. No, abortion, it's sick in a lot of cases. So that's why it was powerful. The other reason is because often when I criticize Planned Parenthood, I hear, well, that's only a small part of what they do, Mike. You know, it's just a little tiny bit of what they do. Yeah, but that's how they get a lot of their money, as she pointed out as well. And they do thousands of abortions every year. Powerful. So three examples right there of ordinary citizens with a message. You know, I remember I saw some leftist trolls criticize the list of speakers before the convention. Um, Criticize it all you want. It's going to be effective. It is. I'm just being honest with you. And it's actually, like I said, the convention went a lot better, actually went a lot better than I thought. I didn't think it was going to be this good. Uh, Tom, I didn't really get your thoughts on the convention as a whole. I wanted to get your take before we uh, get off the air. Today. Well, what's interesting is the fact that the, the, the audio cuts you just played happened to be the ones that I spent the most time with. Really? Them and uh, Mr. Sandman. Sandman. Yeah, that's there. another. another. He was excellent for being, what, 19 years yeah. old, poised, had his thoughts collect you know in the right order and uh, was very uh i thought a strong strong voice yeah and it's interesting too another non-politician mm-hmm. you know the thing that always gets me about the sandman situation is when all that started and you heard interviews i'm just he's just a kid i can't believe how many people just tried to ruin his life and i'm like he just stood all he did was stand there wearing a hat he's just a child and they really tried to ruin him but i think you're right it's interesting that you said exactly what i thought that the most effective powerful speakers i think so far have been the the Mm non-politicians the everyday people who have a powerful message and support trump because trump supports their message it's not because they like trump personally or something it's they support what trump is doing and every night every night they've had a lot of black voices who Mm -hmm. have been excellent And I think that's going to have an effect as well. Appreciate you listening to the show. Um, If you missed any of the show, catch the podcast on the iHeartRadio app or anywhere podcasts are available. You can like the Beyond Reason Radio Facebook page. Follow me on Twitter at Michael Yaffe. I'll be hosting Good Morning Orlando again tomorrow morning, 6 to 9 a.m. Join me in then and uh, catch you guys next time.